Chad HT Show, News Talk 95.1 FM and 790 AM KFYO. Joining us on the phones, Republican strategist Matt Mikoviak. Matt, good morning. How are you? I'm doing great, Chad. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, there's uh, uh, quite a bit to get to uh, in the news uh, go, uh, that, that's uh, that's going on. And we'll get to the whole Syria, Trump, uh, you know, what, what may... May or may not be going through the president's mind a, a little bit later. Uh, I, I do want to start off. There was a, I believe it was the Washington Post. Uh, they, they came out with an article over the weekend uh, about uh, this this idea of Republicans seizing on the the discussion point of impeachment, and that that uh, you know so many Democrats have come out and, and used the impeachment wording. That uh, if Republicans can sell, hey, if uh, if Democrats take back the House and Senate, they're going to impeach Trump. This is a winning mm-hmm. winning argument for Republicans. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, first of all, it's kind of funny to me that um, that they're denying that that's truly what they want to do. Um, you know, if you've turned on a television in the last year, um, you, you've heard Democrats make arguments against Trump about corruption, about obstruction of justice, about collusion, about financial crimes, about campaign finance violation. I mean, you go down the list, it's, it's, you know, it's incredible. And the language they've used has been over the top from the very beginning. And so it must have been quite shattering um, to, to see Mueller announce that Trump has personally not a, not a, a subject of, uh, excuse me, a target of the investigation at this point. Now, we'll see if he interviews him and what, what comes of that. Um, but look, I mean, we don't have to. We don't have to, you know, debate this. I mean, they they've had, I believe, two votes in the House on this that the Democrats have forced. I think the first one got sixty or so Democrats, and the second vote got eighty or so. So it increased. Um, now we'll have to see what happens in some of these primaries on the Democratic side. Let's we'll see what happens in terms of these general elections and targeted races, in terms of what kind of Democrats get elected. But I don't have a whole lot of doubt that they're going to hold an impeachment vote in the House if they take the House back in the first, you know, ninety days of the new. Congress, um, they can pre- pre- you know pretend that's not something they want. It's certainly something their base wants. Um, so uh, it's interesting that that they're you know they're running against Trump, but they're not running in favor of impeachment. And I think right. to me that's a that's a that's a needle they're trying to thread. It's going to be interesting to see whether they can do that. Do you think that's enough of an argument to fire up Republican or at least Trump voters to get them out to the polls? Sure as hell should be. Uh, I hope it is. I don't know if it will be. Um, you know, it, 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 you can make an argument that if you look across, um, you know, the last year in terms of the special elections, uh, obviously we lost the seat in Pennsylvania. We lost an unlosable race for U.S. Senate in Alabama that was very unique. We lost the Virginia governor's race. Um, those races weren't necessarily about impeachment directly, but obviously they were some type of referendum on the direction of the country and Trump. Um, now, if you look at a lot of the other races, the down ballot races, the special elections that have occurred, Democrats haven't maybe they, they've won some of those, they've lost some of those, but they've gained margins in just about every race. So the Democrats remain more enthusiastic than Republicans are at the moment, and the suburbs seem to be in revolt against Trumpism and Republicans right now. And that the, that the combination of those two things puts the House at risk. Uh, and so, to your to your point, um, is that enough? I don't know. It, it depends whether you know Republicans can really come together. Um, you know, one of the challenges is going to be, I don't know that there's going to be much else accomplished legislatively the rest of this year um, that, that, you know, that's consequential. They may hold another couple votes on tax cuts. Um, obviously, if there's a Supreme Court vacancy with Kennedy retiring, which is something people are watching for in the next few months, I think that could obviously uh, raise the stakes and, and get people fired up again. But no, look, Republicans have to be motivated this year. And, and particularly to your point, it's Trump voters. I think sort of core Republicans will probably turn out because of how important these, these legislative races are, these congressional and Senate races. But the, the question is, are Trump voters who generally haven't voted Republican in the past, who provided that margin for Trump in the election in states like Michigan uh, and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where there are a lot of key congressional races, are they going to turn out if Trump's not on the ballot? And to me, that's going to be a question of can Trump uh, motivate those voters by going to those districts and by making those arguments and doing it in a disciplined way. And that's something we're going to have to wait to see if that happens. If you're in the RNC or if you're one of the, the big money donors, are, are you are, are you shifting money yet to basically just candidates in the Senate right now and saying that the House is, it's a done deal that the Democrats are going to take back the House? Or do you think there's still enough of a uh, possibility that Republicans hold on to the House? It's a great question. I mean, first of all, there's enough money to do all these things. So I don't know that necessarily you have to make that choice. 
yet. Um, there will be choices made in the fall, and they're going to have to decide which states are, are truly winnable, which seats are, are truly winnable, which ones aren't. Uh, and that's always a, a you know excruciating um, you know that has to be made. Um, but but look, I think that 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 for for a lot of the donors, they look at the Senate and they say, listen, we're going to hold the Senate. That's strategically crucial, given given the importance of justice of, of the Supreme Court justices uh, in the courts, given the ability to block the House if the Democrats take the House back. So I do think there's I do think the Senate races are going to be funded at a minimum. The question is, will the, the, the contested House races be funded? And this is where the retirements come into play and make a huge difference because if you have you know to, to have as many retirements as they've had in the house on in the house on the republican side it it what it's done is it's expanded the map so you now have more seats in play that's it's going to cost more money and so there's not going to be enough money to fund 50 house seats in, in 10 or 12 senate races there will be enough to fund six or eight senate races and 20 or 25 house seats generally so you know who gets left behind um and so a lot of that's going to depend on who the democrats nominate they have primary fights between hillary candidates and bernie candidates in a lot of places uh, it's going to depend a lot on how the Republican candidates do. Are they disciplined? Are they raising money? Are they working? All those kinds of factors come together. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to see. But look, the wind is in the face of the Republicans. There's no question about it right now in this midterm. The question is, is it going to be a tsunami or is it just going to be a light breeze? And a lot of that's going to depend, I think, on the economy, how the president does, how some of these major issues get resolved, things like North Korea. Uh, there's a lot of variables out there right now. Visiting with Matt McCoviak, Republican strategist. Uh, Matt, later on I've got... Uh... Congressman Ben yep. O'Rourke, who's going to be on the program, yep. obviously he made big-time national news with his fundraising haul in the first quarter of uh, this year with raising, what, around $6.7 million. Uh, the, the national media seems to be, you know, they, you know, just like with the blue wave, right? The national media seems to uh, be looking at this now and going, huh, maybe. Uh, meanwhile, Texas media is is saying, "Hey, pump pump the brakes a little bit here." Wendy Davis was able to raise a lot of money too in Texas, and you see how she did against Greg Abbott. It, for for you know Democrats out there, and even for Republicans who are watching this, I had a caller last week who said, "Should I be worried about this? Is, is this is this something that you know Republicans really need to keep an eye on, or is this just a lot of Democrats are excited about Beto O'Rourke?" Well, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, you have to take Beto seriously in the sense that he's working hard and he is raising more money than he should be, given the long odds he faces. Um, he's clearly going to be, you know, the best funded U.S. Senate candidate on the Democratic side probably since the, the early 90s. Yeah. Um, and so we haven't really seen that. And given that you have low limits, hard, hard caps on individual contributions, it's very hard to raise money for, for federal races, uh, particularly for expensive statewide races in places like Texas. So, you know, it looks like he may have 10 or 12 you know, million dollars overall to spend. Um, I have some doubt that he's going to be able to, to continue raising at the pace he has been because I just think the race is never going to tighten closely enough that he's going to be able to convince people it's winnable in the, in the, you know, in the fall in the last two months. Um, I think what hasn't happened yet is there hasn't really been the discussion of issues at the, at the statewide level that, that's coming. Um, you know, O'Rourke's pretty unabashedly liberal. He's really more aligned with the Bernie Sanders wing than the Hillary wing. And this state is just not in a place where it, it, it sees issues that way. And ultimately, races come down to issues. Um, you know, what, I mean, O'Rourke can make, uh, make, you know, criticisms of Cruz personally or running for president or, or whatever. But ultimately, Cruz is more in line on issues with Texans than O'Rourke is. And I don't think we've really had that debate yet. Um, you know, he actually was fairly weak in his primary in terms of his overall performance. Cruz was actually pretty strong in his performance. So we'll see where, where the race goes. The work is kind of interesting, and there's no question the national media is trying to make this more of a race, mostly because they don't like Cruz. They don't like that he's a conservative. They don't like that he fights. They don't like that he rejects uh, their premise uh, in, 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 in their questioning uh, from time to time. So, look, I, I think it's going to be an interesting race because the work is sort of doing a little better than, than, than probably people might have expected. But this is still... Uh, a red state, and it's going to remain that way. Matt, uh, tell folks how they can sign up for your newsletter and also uh, about your uh, podcast. Yeah, we, we do a morning newsletter, as your listeners know, called Must Street Texas. We put all the news from around the state into one email delivered to your inbox. Uh, we have 3,000 Texans that subscribe. You can sign up at mustreadtexas.com. There's a free one-week trial on there. It's a great product that we put out. Uh, I had the pleasure and, and really the honor of, of uh, interviewing EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt live in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday of last week. Uh, obviously, he's been in the news quite a bit of late. And so he's our most recent podcast guest. The podcast is called Mac on Politics. 
Uh, the video is actually on the Washington Times uh, Facebook page. It's a podcast I do with them, but you can find it in the iTunes Store, on Google Play, on Stitcher, and at MacOnPoliticsPodcast.com. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty timely podcast right there. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> Matt, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks. That's, Take care. That's Matt McCoviak. You can uh, follow him on Twitter at Matt McCoviak.